Greetings, friends of astrobiology. Welcome to a brand new episode of Ask an Astrobiologist, a show where we celebrate science and celebrate scientists. My name is Sanjoy Som, and this program is made possible by contributions from the NASA Astrobiology Program, LC, the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Tech, and the nonprofit Blue Marble Space. We're very excited this month to have a researcher from France, Dr. Sean Raymond, who is an astronomer at the Astro Astrophysical Laboratory in the city of Bordeaux in France. Et bien sûr, à toutes, à toutes et à tous qui se connectent depuis les pays francophones, bienvenue à tous. Nous sommes vraiment ravis de vous avoir. Dr. Raymond, it's a pleasure to have you here. I know from your publication record, you're so busy studying all these really cool stuff. And so thanks for being uh, with us today. Well, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Like we enjoy doing in this show is before we start talking about the science is uh, go back in time a little bit. But before we actually talk about that, um, we had our uh, monthly background quiz that we need to get started with first. So this month, it's a magnificent place on our solar system that uh, we have the pleasure of having as a background. And last month, it was a different moon in the solar system that was our background. And the question this month was, well, what was that moon? And a few of you got it right. Um, I think only one, actually, and that's Adam Robinson. Shout out to you. Good job. It was indeed Europa and the beautiful Linnaeus that are on the moon. So uh, next time uh, on the show, what is the planet behind me? And I'll give you a shout out. So uh, with that said, Sean, if we go back in time many, many years ago in a galaxy not too far away, <laughs> what caused you to become a scientist in the first place? I mean, I don't think I, my, my story is pretty common among scientists. It was, I kind of daydreamed a lot when I was a kid. I read lots of science fiction books and I was good at math. And so when you put those things together, you naturally kind of gravitate towards science. I got really into, into space stuff in uh, high school. when I started reading all these uh, classic science fiction stories by people like uh, Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. And from there, I mean, that was kind of the seed of my interest in it. So how did you develop that interest growing up in high school? And then I know you traveled quite a bit until your position today. Like, take us through that path and, and what triggered that interest in, in astronomy? Um, so, so when I got to college, I was interested in math and, and science in general. And so I, I took a bunch of math classes. I took physics and I took astronomy. There was one astronomy class in the college I went to, the small college in Maine called Bowdoin. Uh, and so there's only one astronomy class. And I loved it. It was really exciting to me. But there was nowhere to go from there. So, so I wasn't sure what to do next. And so what I did is, is junior year of college, a lot of my friends did a abroad or a semester abroad where they went and basically partied somewhere. <laughs> you know, they, they went to, they often went to, to Spain or places like that. Uh, and I did the opposite. I ended up uh, applying to, to go to Caltech for a year to learn about astronomy because I knew they had good astronomy there. So I went there, I learned a bunch of astronomy, it got me even more excited about it. Uh, then I applied to grad school, I went to Seattle to, to do astronomy, and then it kind of just went from there. And then you, you moved out of the United States to start a research career in France. How was that transition? Is it easy to do? And I know as a postdoc, you had a kid too, so you're changing countries, having a kid. How did you get that keep going? That was awesome. Oh yeah, so, well, so, so grad school, I was in Seattle, then I, uh, I actually had a an unusual experience for, for being a postdoc too. So I, when I, by the time I finished my thesis, my wife had already started a program in genetic counseling in Denver. And so I only applied for jobs there and I didn't get any. And so I was stuck. I had no job for, for several months. I got really bummed out. I was getting close to applying to, you know, REI or places like this, <laughs> but it didn't quite come to that. I, uh, I, had, I ended up getting rescued by Vicky Meadows of uh, virtual planetary laboratory fame, who, who hired me to work for her for a year until I got this other fellowship to, to keep things going. And so yeah, while I was in Colorado as a postdoc, I had a, a kid, we had a, our son, Owen, uh, who just turned 10 now. And uh, while we were in Colorado, I also was invited out to France to basically as a sabbatical sort of, while I was still a postdoc, which is really cool. So I came to Indeed. Bordeaux then and, and stayed for about three months, met a lot of people and they, they kind of persuaded me to apply for a permanent job here. And I was kind of nervous about it. And they persuaded me to apply by saying, ah, you know, you probably won't get it. You usually have to apply many years in a row. So if you apply now, then maybe in two, three, four years, you'll be in a good position to get the job. 
But then somehow I was in the right place at the right time. And I got the job the first time. And, and we came here. And the rest is history, like they say. <laughs> you mentioned Vicky Meadows. She's been a mentor for many of us early careers in, in astrobiology over the years. Is, he, and, and is there any other people that you looked up to growing up as a scientist that helped you along the way? So, so yeah, if I was going can, to... I can think of two people that I would consider kind of mentors starting, say, in grad school to now. And one of them is, is Vicky Meadows. She helped me out a lot in many different ways. And the other one is uh, Suzanne Hawley, professor at the uh, University of Washington. She was kind of a mentor to, to half the grad students, I think. She organized them. She played sports with us. She played basketball and softball with us. She had us over to her house to have pizza and drink beer and, and gave us like kind of specific advice on how to approach different problems that came up. It was really helpful. So, so those are kind of the two key people that helped me out. I think that's a common story for all of us who are scientists who really benefit from mentoring to develop this career. So all of you who are watching who want to become scientists, make sure you connect with good mentors. You know, that's important. We've all done it, and that it makes life a lot easier. So since you've been in Bordeaux, you've been studying some really incredible stuff. I was mentioning the history of water on, on Earth. You were actually on the paper that uh, announced the discovery of those the seven planet system, the Trappist system, a couple of months ago, which is fantastic. And you, you also you simulate different types of solar systems, so we can talk forever. So perhaps uh, let, let's start with the beginning. I know your research to begin with uh, for your for your doctorate was around the history of water on Earth. Um, where did where where did our oceans come from? So that's a big question. <laughs> so, so it's really interesting, though, because based on everything that we think we know about how planets form, all the, the building blocks of the Earth, at least around where Earth is now, uh, are on orbits close to Earth, should have been dry. So we you know the, the mystery is where did Earth get its water from then? And so we think it had to be delivered from somewhere colder, from somewhere further away from the sun where the conditions were such that you had ice and they, they, you know, that, that could condense somehow the icy, icy bodies, maybe icy asteroids or comets bashed into the Earth as it was growing. And so it used to be thought that the Earth formed dry. Then there was this big kind of deluge of comets that delivered the water. And that was the state of the art of around the year 2000 or so. And that's when things started to change. And then it, it it switched from thinking that it was mostly comets to mostly asteroids. And the reason for that is that the chemical signature of water in comets is different than in asteroids. And the one in asteroids, basically it's kind of asteroids called C-types that are linked with carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. So we have pieces of them. And we can measure the water in these C-types, these carbonaceous meteorites, looks like water on Earth. And so then we thought that it was just kind of a, you know, that the Earth formed mostly from stuff nearby. But as it was forming, some little fraction of that originated further out, out in what's now the asteroid belt. Of course, then the story kept getting more and more complicated because those models that did great at getting water on Earth didn't match other parts of the solar system. So we've been spending a lot of time trying to, you know, have a model that can reproduce the whole solar system. And it doesn't, you know, it's great to, to understand where water on Earth came from. That's only one piece of this big puzzle. And you got to get all the pieces to fit, otherwise it doesn't work. And so, so since then, the story's evolved. There's new models for how the solar system may have formed. And going along with each model, there's different mechanisms for how this water-rich stuff somehow got close to the solar, you know, closer to the sun and bashed into the Earth as it grew. And right now, the latest thinking is that Jupiter played a key role just by growing. Just Jupiter growing tosses a bunch of nearby stuff all over the place. That stuff should probably have had a decent amount of water in some of the bashing into the earth. Sorry, that was probably a longer answer than you were expecting. But no, this is really interesting. This is really interesting because it, it, it does perhaps play into a role in thinking about life on other worlds. If life does indeed depend on water and Earth is in the right habitable zone of the star, not too far, not too close, and yet you also need a giant planet far away to kind of send all the material into the inner solar system to, to see the planet with, with water, for example. That does, does that mean that, you know, for our life to evolve on a planet, does it need a large Jupiter-like planet outside of it? So, so that's a good question. So the question that you asked me, and that most people ask, is, you know, it's basically, and, and also the way I frame the answer is, why is Earth so wet? Right? Why do we have water at all? 
Uh, but another question, and these days we're kind of flipping the things around, is why is Earth so dry? Based on how we think these things form, it's really hard to prevent things from getting, from, from water-rich bodies coming into the inner solar system. And so it's possible that we think that Jupiter played a key role. You know, it did, as it grew, we think it sprinkled some water-rich stuff onto the Earth and got the water that we have onto there. But it's possible that it played another role in terms of protecting the inner solar system from what was beyond Jupiter. And so we think that as planets grow, you know, they grow in these big disks of gas and dust around young stars. And as they grow, they tend to launch density waves in the gas. Once, say, once, a, once an object is about the size of the Earth or so. And so we're talking more, you know, things that are like the cores of the giant planets or Uranus and Neptune and Saturn, those things, not the growing Earth. So further out, those things launch density waves and that tends to change their orbits. It tends to make a move inward. And what we think is Jupiter's role may not have been so much to, to put just the right amount of water on Earth, but it may have been even more important that it blocked the inward migration of these bodies. And so we see planets that, you know, that are very close to their stars, those so-called super-Earth planets. They exist around half of all stars, right? They're super common. They're all over the place. One model for how they got there is that they've started off you know, farther out, like like Uranus and Neptune or Saturn. And then they migrate inward and end up really close to their stars. And so Jupiter's role may have been to basically block that migration and protect the growing rocky planets from those invaders. So so again, that's it's another idea that's out there. But it's uh, That's it's fascinating. So that means that the location where the planets are in our current solar system has changed over time. Is it still changing? So it definitely changed over time. It's not changing much now. Now, the planet's orbits are, are, their orbital distances are more or less fixed. And so they evolve and they exchange angular momentum by kicking each other a little bit here and there. But there's not much chance of a big change in the future. Between now and when the sun becomes a red giant in a, you know five billion years, there's something like a 1% chance that the terrestrial planet system will go unstable. And, you know, there'll be a collision between planets. This is actually this French guy, Jacques Lascaux, showed this really nicely. Um, so that, that's possible, but unlikely. So much more likely is just that our orbits will be stable. They're, they're still chaotic. You can't predict what they'll, you know, what they'll do in, you know, indefinitely into the future, but they're unlikely to go unstable. For those of you who are sci-fi writers, you're welcome for the amazing material that was just <laughs> talked about. <laughs> so let's talk about these solar systems a bit more. That's something you simulate in a computer is try to predict what kind of planetary configurations could be stable around different kind of stars. How special, how unique is our solar system? Do, do, would, you, would we expect it elsewhere? What other stable planetary configurations have you found? Ah, so this is a, that's a big question. So, so there's, there's two kinds of ways to answer. I can either answer from the point of view of, of observations of what we know empirically or from what comes out of the computer. So let me do the observations part first. So, so take the solar system and put it around another star and then let's observe it with our current Earth technology. Uh, what could we see? We have eight planets. The only one that we could find is Jupiter. So if we're trying to figure out how common solar systems are, what we're really looking for are Sun-Jupiter systems. And so based on just the orbit of Jupiter, you know, what, what is Jupiter? We know Jupiter's mass. What we can measure is Jupiter's mass and kind of its orbital distance and its orbital shape. And if you put those three things together, what fraction of stars like the Sun have that? It's about 1%. About 10% of stars have a planet of Jupiter's mass, and about 10% of those have orbits, you know, broadly similar to Jupiter's. So we don't know how common solar systems are overall, but they can't be more common than 1%, because we know that all we can see is, is that. So it's possible that Earths are more common than that, but solar systems can't be more common, if that makes Interesting. sense. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah, that's great. If, so if then, any of you who are watching have questions for Dr. Raymond, please use hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter, or if you are on Siganet, type into the chat room. For those of you who are connecting on Facebook Live, uh, yeah, I think ask questions there too. We'll be monitoring, monitoring those. 
So, Sean, you've been working on on these exoplanets and habitability of these uh, of these uh, of these other worlds, and you've been on the paper of the Trappist system. Could you remind us what Trappist is? How you got involved, and what does that possibly mean as an observational target? So, the, I mean, so so Trappist one is it's one of the coolest planetary systems that's been found to date. So the star itself is this puny little star. It's barely a star. It's just barely above the brown dwarf star boundary. So it's it's only about 8% the mass of the sun. It's really faint. But it has a system of seven known planets uh, that are all in very compact orbits. And since this thing is so faint, these orbits that are so close to the star are in, you know, several of them are in the habitable zone, which is pretty cool. And uh, so they're all, all seven of them are broadly Earth-sized, you know, within a factor of, you know, 30% or something like that of the size of the Earth. And to me, what the coolest part of all is that their orbital configuration is very special. They're, each pair of planets is in what we call an orbital resonance. So they go around and kind of integer multiple times each other. So, for example, uh, a couple of them are in three to two resonance. That means that the inner planet goes around three times for every two orbits of the outer one. And the whole seven planet system is in a giant resonant chain, which is really cool. It's a really nice setup. And That's we stable? think that this is it's perfectly stable uh, if you take into account that the planets didn't just kind of form there by chance by bashing into each other. They probably migrated inward. Jupiter protecting the inner solar system from things migrating inward. This is an example where it's pretty clear these planets did migrate at least to some degree, to end up in that configuration. So so that's the system. And I played a very small role in, in, in discovering it, but it was really fun and exciting. I was really happy to be part of it. Uh, I was contacted, me and, and another guy, Franck Zedzis, in Bordeaux. We were contacted, uh, I guess, a couple of years ago now, after they had found three planets around Trappist-1. And the third of those planets uh, looked weird. So they only had a few different transits that they'd seen. And at least in two cases, the transits were double. It looked like there were two planets crossing in front of the star at the same time. And this, this means something's, you know, something's going on because the odds of seeing two planets at once right as they're passing in front of the star are very small. So what they thought, the, the, you know, Michael Gidon, the main guy, uh, and Amory Trio, what they thought at the time was, it's, was it possible that this was actually a binary planet? So a planet you know, instead of an Earth-Moon system, like an Earth-Earth system uh, in orbit around the star. And they asked me and Franck and then another guy, Jeremy Lecomte, to kind of think about this. You know, would this be possible? Could this ever form? Would it be stable? Uh, you know, what would it look like if we were measuring it? And so we started thinking about that. In the meantime, they got more observations and they found that there was this long resonant chain. And, and so then the, the explanation for why they saw double transits was because of the resonance, not not because it was a binary. But it was still exciting. And it was fun to be part of. <laughs> yeah, fascinating, fascinating. So the James Webb Space Telescope should be launching towards the end of this year. And the TRAPPIST system is not particularly far, astronomically speaking. What do you think we will learn new about this system if we ever po point to it with the, with the James Webb? I, this is a, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I ask people about this kind of thing a lot, exactly what can be nailed down from observations. And it's very, I mean, planets are complicated. And so exactly what is going to come out, I can't predict. I don't know. I think it's always worth going and looking because you can never, it's great to come up with as many crazy ideas as you possibly can, but then you got to test them. <laughs> so I don't think it's worth <laughs> You know, thinking that we know it's coming in advance, it's worth going and looking and seeing. And uh, do we know I don't have any deep wisdom about what's going to be found. Do we know if these planets have atmospheres? Because atmospheres tend to hold the signatures of life. It would be awesome if they do. I mean, I think given that they that, this, that they migrated, clearly they migrated at least to some degree. Um, that means that they must have started off a little bit further out than they are now. Right now, the outermost ones are. The outermost couple, couple of planets are near or even a little bit past uh, what we call the snow line. So the snow line is is the distance from the star beyond which ice can condense. So inside the snow line, you can build plants out of rocks. 
past the snow line, you can build plants out of rocks and water. So you expect things to be much more water rich past that. So at least the outermost one or two planets is probably has a decent amount of water just from where it is now. And if the other ones migrate inward, it's possible that they all have a decent amount of water. And if they have water, then they probably have all the other volatiles that could contribute to an atmosphere. So, so this is kind of, you know, a line of thinking that would argue they probably have atmospheres. But like I said, you got to go check. We have to check, indeed. Um, fingers crossed that it's an exciting system. <laughs> so Trappist is another solar system. We're in ours, and only recently have we found out the possibility that you can have material transit between solar systems. We were visited, was it a couple months ago, by this uh, cigar-shaped object called Oumuamua that came from far away, zoomed by our star, and is on its way out. And I know you've been thinking and studying it a little bit. Can you tell us more about this, this strange body? Oh, yeah. This is a super exciting discovery. It had been anticipated for decades. People have been thinking about this because we know that planets, you know, planet formation is not 100% efficient. And models have shown for a long time that, you know, a lot of the building blocks of planets, whatever doesn't end up in a planet, a lot of it gets chucked out. And some of that stuff that gets chucked out of other solar systems should wander along and come through ours. And that's what happened. So in October this year, uh, the PanStar survey out of Hawaii found this really fast moving, pretty small object uh, named Oumuamua, you know, a visitor from, from far away. And so this thing is, is very strange. It's, uh, it seems to be very stretched out. That's interpreted, that's inferred basically from its brightness variations. Its brightness changes by about two and a half magnitudes. That's about a factor of 10 in actual brightness uh, every seven hours or so. And it's thought that that's because of its shape. They think it's this kind of weird cigar-shaped thing that's sort of tumbling. It's not even rotating in a nice way. It's tumbling, not along any of its principal axes. And every so often, it's kind of pointed at us. And so the surface area is so small that the brightness dips a lot. And so, so that's one weird thing. It's also weird that it's it passed very close to the sun inside Mercury's orbit, but it didn't give off any water or anything. Yet its colors, if you measure, you know, its brightness in different wavelengths, its colors look like objects in the solar system that have a lot of water, like uh, like uh, C-type asteroids or D-type asteroids or those kind of things. And so it's it's this weird conundrum. No one knows quite what to make of it. Huh. So. This, this tumbling makes for a pretty terrible alien spaceship, though. <laughs> I would think so, yeah. Because otherwise, it's very similar to Arthur C. Clarke's book, Rendezvous with Rama. Yes. Where this, you know, this, this perfect cylinder comes in the solar system. I actually reread that book recently, just after after they discovered Oumuamua, because it reminded me of it. Except <laughs> the key difference, like it's the same story. Humanity discovers this thing entering the solar system. Uh, there's a couple of little subtle differences, like Oumuamua's brightness variations are huge, and in Rama they're tiny. And the reason they're tiny in Rama is because it's a smooth metal surface that you know always reflects the same amount of light. <laughs> so if the ecliptic plane of all the planets is like this, Oumuamua came like essentially vertical and straight through, right? Can we can we back out the trajectory and kind of know where it came from? People have been trying to do this, and there's no conclusive determination of you know a given star or star forming region that it came from. So it has its its velocity in space is similar to that of the nearby stars. So that means you can't. You know, disentangle it too well from just other star. So it came from out there somewhere. So so there's different models for how it got there. Uh, I have my own model, so I'll explain mine. Mine is my thinking is that it's just a leftover from planet, you know, from planet formation. But it's probably just to account for for some details. It, I would think that it's not a leftover what's called a planetesimal, but that's a leftover chunk of one. So I think that in the process... What's a planetesimal again? Oh, sorry. I should explain this. You're right. So a planetesimal is basically a building block of planets, things that are, say, 10, 100 kilometers in size. So the big, the big potato-shaped things from Star Wars, that's like a planetesimal. And so, so that's what we think plants are born from. You know, what, A bunch of those form within these disks of gas, and then they bash into each other to form larger things. They're kind of the seeds of, of plants. And so when planets get big, they have so much gravity that nearby planetesimals often get kicked around. And if a planet as big as Jupiter forms, its gravity is so strong that a lot of the stuff nearby 
gets flung into space. You know, it, it can give such strong gravitational kicks they can kick planetesimals, you know, out so so fast that they never come back. But once wow. in a while, they get clo- really close to Jupiter on the way, it's similar to comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 in, in the early 90s that came very close to Jupiter and was torn to pieces. Uh, that can happen sometimes. And so so our model is that, that Oumuamua is one of those pieces, not a pristine planetesimal, but a piece of something that got torn to pieces torn to shreds on its way to getting launched into space. And that can maybe account for why it's tumbling and it's weird shaped and stuff. So that's, so that's cool. one possible word. So does that mean that presumably there are some early pieces of our own solar system that are going through other galaxies right now? Uh, not other galaxies, sorry, other solar systems? <laughs> I mean, definitely, it's, it's unavoidable. So there's pieces from, there's multiple generations of stuff that's gotten kicked out. Uh, Basically, stuff, anything past Earth's orbit, even interior to Earth's orbit, there are pieces, you know, at least according to our computer simulations of how the planets form, you know, the process of plant formation is maybe half efficient. So probably about half the building blocks within the solar system stuck around. The other half got kicked out. So most of it is probably in the form of small things. But th- we may even have lost an ice giant. Uh, that's, wow. that's an idea for... Uh, one idea that, that David Nesvorny had in Swiri, the idea being that we think the giant planets in the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, had a late instability. And that might explain you know, things like the late heavy bombardment. And to make their models work much better, like an order of magnitude better, uh, they invoke the existence of an extra planet at the start to, that basically carries away excess energy and is ejected. And so it's possible that, that we had another planet or even two other planets that were ejected uh, shortly after they formed. And they're wandering the, wandering within the galaxy, you know, but I don't think we'd recognize them anymore, but they're, they're out there. So a gas giant that's flying away from a star would have probably his, its atmosphere just collapse down into a solid, right? Uh, I mean, so, so a, a giant planet? Yeah, you mentioned an ice giant was flung out. Yeah. I mean, people have modeled this because it's not too different from the idea of Planet Nine. You know, that this possible extra planet in the solar system that's out, you know, at several hundred AU. People have been modeling that to see what would it look like. And so people have been modeling, you know, different possible atmospheres, what they would, how they would evolve over billions of years in very cold temperatures. And uh, I am afraid I don't know the answer. <laughs> but people have been thinking about this. <laughs> Yeah. That's fascinating. Just absolutely fascinating. So we could talk on this stuff for, for a long time. I definitely want to switch the question to the Q&A time to our audience. Again, if you have any questions for Dr. Raymond, please use hashtag AskAstroBio, and uh, we'll get them answered. Um, the first question I see is from Jacob. Hello, Jacob. And he asks, what are some of the most salient differences you have noticed between basic science funding in France and the EU compared with the United States? Ah, okay, science funding. So the general structure of, of how things are funded here is quite different. So the standard track is, is, is somewhat different. The, like our, I mean, I'll just start describing the difference in like my department versus departments in the U.S. In the U.S., typically a professor has many grad students and postdocs, and there's kind of this sort of like pyramid shape where there's one or maybe a few people with permanent jobs and a lot of people with temporary jobs, postdocs, grad students who are learning, and 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 that's kind of the general structure. Here in France, it's quite different, and it, but it changes from country to country, because in Germany, it's more like that uh, pyramid-type structure. Here in France, there's more, kind of a higher proportion of people with permanent jobs, and that, and fewer grad students. It's hard, harder to get funding for, for many grad students. Uh, you know, we have some, but just not quite as many. Uh, and that just kind of changes the dynamic of things. In terms of, I guess, in terms of overall funding for things, it's not that different. There's there's a decent amount of astrobiology type research and interest in different things. Overall, the general, the means are not quite as big as in the U.S. And so it's often, oftentimes in terms of making decisions, to kind of see where other places are going and try to find a niche where you can have the most impact for your contribution rather than trying to repeat what someone else is doing. Uh, I don't know. That's that's what comes to mind. 
Cool, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Penny, who asks, do you have a sense of how much interstellar organic carbon might survive the process of solar system formation and planetary accretion? Do you think new solar system has to start all over again to make organic carbon on its planets, or does it inherit a legacy? It's a good question. Ah, that is a good one. So, I, I mean, so I'm not a chemist who studies this because I know people do that. But I think that that uh, a lot of that pristine material is is preserved. Kind of the the there's a debate, you know, when you're forming planets, whether within a disk everything gets really hot and then recondenses, or whether the stuff only only the stuff very close to the star actually gets that hot. And the difference is if everything gets hot, then you would lose volatile things, maybe like organic carbon. And then recondensing them can be an issue. But if only the area kind of close to the star that gets directly heated is really strongly heated, then anything past a certain distance can preserve its carbon. Uh, my impression, not being a specialist in this area, is that people are leaning towards the idea that you can preserve a decent amount of molecules from the interstellar medium or at least from, you know, further out in the solar system. And we see that, you know, for example, in comets that have a lot of organic material. Cool. I'll keep your questions coming. Otherwise, I have a bunch for, uh, for Sean myself. <laughs> so what are you working on these days? You have all these incredible projects of a bunch of different topics. What, how do you keep your attention focused? <laughs> Ah, well, that's the thing. I don't. I don't keep it that focused. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a big thing. Like, how do you decide what to do next? Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you know, in grad school, I had a a, a boss who said, you know, my, my advisor who's, who kind of pointed me in a certain direction. As a postdoc, I had applied to officially do a certain project. And I eventually changed directions a little bit. And then lately, over the past several years, I had this internal debate: like, should I do things that are kind of doing what's already been done and what I've already done, just kind of keep doing a little better and better to get at the details. Or should I look for kind of crazy ideas here and there? And I, I made the conscious decision to try to go for the crazy ideas because I think they're kind of underrepresented and they can sometimes, they can often be valuable just to get a different point of view. And sure, they're, they're wrong a lot of the time too, but you know, as long as you stay bounded within reason, it's it's quite fun. And so over the past few years, I've been, I've thrown out crazy ideas about Jupiter, for example, forming right up next to the sun and then moving outward and uh, and different things related to the solar system. And last year, I had, I had a couple of papers about the asteroid belt. Uh, coming up now, I'm starting to work again on, on super Earths and their compositions. Super Earths are super interesting in terms of, no pun intended there, uh, they're interesting in terms of uh, they're, they're the planets that we're first going to be able to constrain the compositions. And so for some super Earths, you can constrain their compositions. The only time you can really do it is if they're very dense, and then you know they're rocky. But if they're not that dense, then you can't tell if they're rock plus gas or just water. And so telling those apart is, you know, is a tricky exercise. But we can try to see what can you learn about uh, planets from their compositions, whether you can rule out, you can never really confirm anything, but you can rule out certain formation histories if this kind of distribution of compositions is observed, for example. So to wrap up, I'm going kind of in many different directions at once, uh, but that's sort of on purpose. Good for you. Keeps the mind busy. <laughs> uh, another question we have from Adam Smith. Hi, Adam. He asks, why in particular is Oumua very like cigar shaped? Ah, Do we have a sense so, of that? So no one knows the exact why. Uh, I would suggest that it, it's indicative that I, I think it fits this general story that it is not a pristine object, but rather one that was torn to pieces. And so in that story I was telling you before about it kind of not being a pristine planetesimal building block of planet, uh, that might make sense if as it was getting kicked out of its parent star system, it got really close to, say, a Jupiter and was torn to pieces by tides, meaning that, you know, as this object was approaching its, you know, this other Jupiter-like planet, the gravity across the object was so strong, basically the part that was really close to the planet was so much stronger than the part further away that it got stretched out. And that probably wouldn't produce one stretched out thing, it produced a whole bunch of a cloud of fragments. 
but it might be a way to form a, a really stretched out thing. Apart from that, I haven't heard of other models that could do it. Maybe it's doable by another mechanism too, but that's uh, that's the one that comes to mind. Cool. Uh, Frank Celsius asks, Sean, I, if I you know. had, <laughs> if you had to spend a couple billion euros, a couple billion dollars, what kind of mission would you build? Ah, this is a good question. I ask people this all the time. So when I had this thought, I, I had a, I've had a few dinners with people where I ask them this, and uh, I've gotten different answers. Lately, I still am leaning towards the idea of really hammering out at one angle really well. So, so a few years ago, I would have said that I would take that money and I would build maybe 10 big telescopes on the ground to do really precise radial velocity measurements, but on a massive scale. Because a lot, we've learned a ton from doing that, from Can radial velocity what? measurements. So, so what, radial what, velocity what? measurements, what that is, is basically using a spectrograph to measure the, the velocities of stars how fast stars are wobbling. And you can measure the velocity only towards or away from, from us. Uh, but that's how the first several hundred exoplanets were found. And a lot of other interesting things have come from that. Uh, and spectrographs are getting more and more precise. And you know, these days, the best ones can measure about 10 centimeters per second of precision in this velocity. So one option for this billion dollars is to build 10 of those and to really hammer out, do a giant survey and have really good statistics to look for planets with them. The other possibility might be to, to, to just build, I don't know, I don't remember exactly how much Kepler cost. I think it was half a billion dollars, something like that. So I would just launch four Keplers and just go nuts, boom. Because I think the, mag I think the size of the stuff that you would get from those is is hard to, I, I think we learn a lot just from doing the same experiments, but a little better and longer and on a much bigger scale. I know the idea, it's always tempting and most of the funding goes towards fundamentally different projects. A lot of it does anyway. But I think that, that redoing the same one a little better can make big leaps. <laughs> yeah, given how successful Kepler was, it would be neat to think about what you could do if you had such a larger scale mission. Cool. Uh, next question is from Melissa, who asks, would Super Earth have plate tectonics like modern Earth does? So, I have no idea. This is a very good question, and people are very interested in this, because on Earth, we think that this carbonate silicate cycle that's driven by plate tectonics is like the Earth's thermostat, and so it prevents Earth from getting too hot or too cold. Now. If we want to think about habitability of other planets, it's tempting to say, well, let's link it with plate tectonics. Now, like I'm no, I'm no specialist of this, but I've seen talks by people who claim that there's no, it's not clear that plate tectonics was active for a good chunk of Earth's history. So it's not clear that that's really necessarily as important as we think on Earth. But like, like I said, I can't really judge that. But I've seen other studies looking at this for, for super Earths. And it seems that all of the key kind of stresses that are that play a role in causing plate tectonics on Earth should be a little bit stronger. And so I, my understanding from seeing papers is that it's, uh, it's likely that plate tectonics, or it's more likely than not that plate tectonics can operate on, on super Earths. Yeah, I mean, perhaps plate tectonics is not necessarily for life to start, but could be necessary to sustain life on a planet for several billion years. It's an interesting question. Probably not good. I'm not going to hurt anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, the next question is from Netsanet. Hello. And uh, here she asks about gold and platinum formation. At what stage do we get to these, to these elements in, in uh, planetary formation history? So... Um, Gold and platinum and stuff, I believe they're part of the rare earth elements, if I'm not mistaken. And those are not very abundant on Earth's surface. Um, they're thought to have been brought in, basically, they're really interesting on Earth because they're thought to follow iron. And so why, why do we care about this? How did Earth form? You know, it formed through a succession of big impacts. And whenever there was enough, a strong enough impact, we think that there was a core forming event. Basically, the Earth got you know, molten enough that iron sunk in the core and it dragged all these other things with it, like gold and platinum. And iridium is one that's often used to trace this to. 
but these kind of elements got sucked into the core. And so you can imagine if Earth formed by these big collisions and its final, you know, the final thing in Earth's formation was a big collision, all that iron, all that gold, all that platinum would be sucked in the core and we would have none. We wouldn't have, hey, I got a gold ring, right? You, we wouldn't have these kinds of things. They, there wouldn't be any on the surface, but there is. So we think that it came from the small amount of material that hit the Earth after the last giant impact. We think the last giant impact was the one that was not a perfect impact. It spun out a disk of stuff, and from that disk, the moon formed. And after that happened, we think about half a percent of Earth's mass hit the Earth after that. And so Earth still was able to accumulate some uh, material afterwards, bringing along all the gold that we have. Cool. Thank you. That's the story. Our next question is from Maya, who asks if we are able, if we detect one of those wandering bodies, planet-sized bodies, are we, would we be able to tell whether it comes from our own solar system? I don't see how we would ever tell. It would be awesome if we could. <laughs> so, no, so, so I don't see how we would. It would be really neat, you know, if we think, like I was saying, the Earth, I mean, the solar system lost probably lost an ice giant, you know, according to these models. And as the terrestrial planets were forming, it probably lost several Mars-sized objects. Now, we can detect these, hopefully we'll be able to detect these by microlensing, like with the WFIRST mission in the next, you know, decade or so. Uh, but otherwise, you know, they're, they're not abundant enough that we expect them to fly by. And if we happen to get super lucky and one did fly by, well, it wouldn't be great for the stability of the solar system. <laughs> but we also... This all happened so long ago that we wouldn't be able to trace it back. I mean, it takes, if I remember right, it takes the sun a couple hundred million years to do a, a loop around the center of the galaxy. And the solar system is, what, four and four and a half billion years old. So that's more than 20 of these. And so anything that was launched from the solar system is, is gone. We're not going to be able to, okay. to trace it back. Interesting. Good question, Maya. So humans are currently kind of stuck on Earth, right? But it goes without saying that we're trying really hard to get out of it. And perhaps one of our soon new destinations will be Mars. And it would be nice to think about making Mars habitable artificially for humans. Um, Kamru Zaman Tony, I apologize if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, is thinking about microalgae in a large scale to produce oxygen and food for humans uh, on another planet. What are your thoughts about you know, terraforming another planet using technology or otherwise? I mean, I think it's the way to go. On the for humanity on the long term, uh, I think if we stay, I, I've heard this described by people, and I think it's a really good argument that if we stay on Earth, then we're at risk. We're at risk of some kind of cataclysm wiping us out. Now, if humanity wants to, you know, make sure to preserve itself for the long term, which we don't have to want to, but but assuming we do. Then the way to protect, you know, one way to protect it, a kind of first key step, you know, astronomically speaking, is to make it so that we're not reliant on one object, so that one bad event can, can't wipe us out. And so you got to go to wherever, you know, wherever the next best place that's, you know, within the same system for, for life. And Mars is a pretty good candidate since it's nearby. It's, you know, it's not it, it's not habitable, obviously, now. But, uh, you know, it seems like it has resources for, for starting things over. So, so I, I totally agree with that sentiment. And I think in the coming, you know, centuries, that'll be something to, to really think about. Indeed, indeed. And the next question is from Nitin, who is, uh, also has a question about Oumuamua. Do we have a sense of how old it is? No, we can't tell. So, so... One thing that's, uh, I mentioned this briefly, but so all the stars kind of in, in the neighborhood in the galaxy, they have a characteristic kind of speeds as they zoom in around. And stars that are born tend to be born with lower speeds and in time they kind of get excited. And so, you know, if, if, if Oumuamua's speed was very low, you know, relative to the galactic point of view, in the galactic point of view, then we could kind of argue that it was probably on the young side. But it has the similar speeds to nearby stars. And so you can't say anything. It's really, it would be awesome to have uh, better constraints. But right now, it's really, we don't know. Uh, that's a fine answer. <laughs> 
you are very active in uh, public outreach of science, and you have a fantastic blog called planetplanet.net that I encourage all of you who are listening and watching to go check out. Could you tell us how that blog started and how you integrate outreach with your professional scientific career? Sure. So the blog started, I, I mentioned it briefly, uh, that when I was a kid, I wanted to be, well, I wanted to be a baseball player, but that didn't happen. Uh, then I had a phase where I wanted to be a writer. And then after a while, you know, I, I became less interested in being a writer and, and veered towards other things, eventually ended up, up in science. But I've always kind of had this interest in writing a book. It was kind of always on my bucket list. And so a few years ago, I, uh, I contacted some people, uh, actually one guy, Caleb Scharf at uh, Columbia. I, I talked with him a bit because he writes science books that are really good. And so I asked him how he got into this. And he he suggested, he, he liked, I had an idea for a book, and he liked the idea, and he suggested starting a blog just to practice that kind of writing, writing for, not writing for scientists in a technical way, but trying to write in a way that hopefully other people can understand, even if they don't have the background, you know, all the scientific training. And so I started the blog just to practice. And once I did it for a little bit, I started really enjoying it, and this kind of kept going from there. And I, I'm thinking about writing a book still, but I, I still have the blog. And so one th one fun thing I do in the blog is, you know, I do some stuff that's kind of to be expected. I, I summarize recent results. Uh, but I also do things that are kind of imaginative science, like one experiment that I did on my blog that for the first year of my blog got all the traffic pretty much was to say, imagine, right, in our solar system, we have eight planets, a whole bunch of moons, but we have one habitable planet, and that's it. Is there a way to preserve all the orbits and all the objects in the solar system, but rearrange them and end up with a system that has more than one habitable planet? You know, that you can argue quite convincingly, should more than one of those should be habitable. And, and what I did in this blog post was I kept Earth there. I moved out the moon and I substituted, I think Europa or maybe Titan, you know, a large moon of Jupiter or Saturn. I got rid of Mars since we know empirically it, even though it's in, you know, it's it's within many estimates of the habitable zone, you know, it's not doing it. It's not habitable. So I checked out Mars and I moved Jupiter there, and I gave it a bunch of big moons, all the biggest moons. I think I might have put Mars as a moon of Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> and in the end, you know, I could kind of argue that I ended up with something like you know six or seven habitable worlds. And so that kind of experiment on the blog uh, got a lot of attention. People were really interested in it. And so then I kept going and, and integrating kind of science with imaginative things. And when I do that, it's when I get the, the best response from people. So, so yeah, the blog is really fun. I really enjoy it. And uh, it, it kind of veers between, you know, very more serious science stuff and more almost science fiction-y stuff. Uh, but I, I like it when people get interested in it. So you mentioned that you had sci-fi writers contact you about using the solar systems that you've simulated and using physics and know to be stable, and if they could use that for their own stories. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. The, the, so, so following that same theme that I was talking about, about making the solar system better, I decided to, to throw everything I know about orbital dynamics in there to build the ultimate solar system. That's what I called it. <laughs> so the question being, how many planets can you, in theory, pack into the habitable zone. And the last one I did, uh, maybe six months ago, I got 400, it, which doesn't seem possible, but you can actually have a ring of planets orbiting all on the same orbit uh, remain stable. And you can have did many you say rings. 400? Yeah, you, so, so I even, I, I was basing this on recent papers in, in, in celestial mechanics, and I was, I was skeptical about it. So I ran my own n-body simulations to test it. And you can have 416, I think, you know, about Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. Now, I don't think they would ever end up that way. And so, so in the blog post, you know, I argue the only way you could get that is if some advanced civilization designed it that way, you know. And if they designed it that way, couldn't they just take any planet and make it habitable anyway? And then, oh, geez. <laughs> but... Uh, in any case, it's, it's really interesting to kind of combine science with the science fiction in this way. Awesome. And to remind everybody, your blog is at planetplanet.net. I encourage you to go check it out. Uh, we have one question again from Nitin. He wants to follow up with from his uh, Uamua question is, does Earth, is there a risk to Earth from one of these 
extrasolar bodies that come swimming by and can potentially cause damage to our own planet. No, I mean, the impact probability with them is, is tiny. Uh, compared, Earth, you know, gets hit by very small space junk all the time and very large, excuse me, space junk, you know, very rarely. And the biggest risk we have now is from a class of asteroids that cross Earth's orbit. And even those that, that are crossing Earth's orbit, you know, statistically hit us once every 100 million years or something like that. Uh, these objects that are coming in at crazy, crazy angles have a much smaller target, effectively, that they're aiming for. So the, the risk from them is, is very, very small. It's not like it's not 0.0, .0 but it's, it's very small. Right. Right. So we can sleep safe tonight. <laughs> So, Sean, if, you have, if we have listeners or students and who want to become professional astronomers and N-body simulators that fields in scientific careers similar to yours, what advice would you give them? So, a few years ago, I would always encourage people to, to learn computing. Because in grad school, one thing, I had, a, I had actually taken the, a decent amount of computer science stuff in college. And so I felt really happy that I had because I knew how to do basic stuff, enough, enough that I could kind of Basically, I had the tools to learn more. And I used to always encourage people to do that. I don't know. I'm not like, since my kids are the wrong age to know this, like, I don't know how well uh, people who are entering grad school now, like how much computer training they have, whether it's common to already know how to use, you know, Linux-based systems and, and this kind of stuff or not. So I'm not sure how relevant that is anymore. Uh, but that's a key thing anyway. Apart from that, I I would encourage people not to not to be you know single-minded about stuff and to you know to, to read other subjects and to, to to you know read science fiction this kind of stuff just in the interests not you know not that you're going to go become necessarily a science fiction writer although you know why not if you want to uh, but just to kind of keep your mind used to jumping around to different ideas because. A common danger uh, in science is to, you know, to be very, if you're smart enough, you get into grad school, you do a project with your advisor, you keep pushing through and you do that project and maybe you're very good at it. You get your PhD and then it's like, well, what do you do next? And oftentimes the answer is, well, I know how to do this, so I'm going to keep doing that. And that's not necessarily the best use of your resources. If you happen to be the world expert and you're going to do the best at that, then sure, sure, why not? I'm not against do, keeping doing that, but I think there's kind of missed opportunities uh, often by, by people having kind of tunnel vision. And so just trying to break out of that kind of tunnel vision in different ways, I think is very useful and not really talked about very much. So. That's a fantastic note to end with, very astrobiologically relevant when you get insights from your own discipline from outside. So on that note, I want to thank you in particular and our audience for sticking out and listening to our presentation today. It was wonderful to have you, Sean. I know it's late in Europe right now, so thanks for taking the time. Please join oh, us pleasure. next time for another Ask an Astrobiologist. And until then, stay curious.